Well, good evening, friends. Uh, again, it's so nice to see so many uh, familiar faces here. I see the faces of former faculty and staff members, uh, former parents, alumni, folks who have made the school very special over the years. And we have a wonderful uh, couple here this evening who has been part of that, uh, making this such a wonderful and special place. And we look forward to hearing from them uh, in just a few minutes. I wonder if we might gather in our traditional way after the manner of friends with a moment of shared silence. <clears throat> Thank you, friends. Uh, it, and thank you so many of you who submitted questions in advance, which will be the basis of this conversation uh, with friends this evening. And it's very nice to be able to have uh, Bob Woodward and Elsa Walsh as your friends to have, with whom to have a conversation. Uh, Elsa is a trustee at the school, um, a past parent, and a, a very wonderful friend who has uh, contributed enormously to the Board of Trustees over the past few years. Uh, I remember the last time I really saw Bob and Elsa together at a, a Sidwell Friends function, they were delivering a commencement speech. And um, it was Elsa who <laughs> introduced me to that wonderful Henry James quote that the three most important things in life are to be kind, the second is to be kind, and the third is to be kind. And uh, that's the way that Elsa lives her life. So it's great to have her with us tonight. And she's also a rem remarkable journalist. I want to tell us one story about Bob. Uh, and Bob, I don't know if you remember this or not, but uh, you spoke at the upper school when I was the uh, principal of the upper school many years ago. And we had a wonderful conversation in the office and then you went out uh, to talk to the students and it was right after, I think the second Bush book. And uh, you took questions. You, had to, you were heading off to Philadelphia for, for a speech right afterwards. And so you had, you had to catch a, a train. And uh, I remember the students were heckling you for um, writing some nice words about George Bush, um, which was surprised, uh, surprising such a thing would come from our student body. But you walked through all the questions and you said, are there any questions, any other questions before I leave? I've got to catch this train. No other questions. And you pulled this card out of your pocket and you looked down and you said, well, I thought you would ask me the identity of Deep Throat. And so I wrote it down on this card <laughs> so since you didn't ask me, I won't be able to tell you. And this was, of course, before Mark Felt's identity was um, uh, uh, made public, and you just walked out down the aisle of the auditorium and out the back uh, of the auditorium. And that is one of my most memorable Sidwell Friends moments. So um, uh, thank you for being with us to give a, a yet another one tonight. We have a, a wonderful person and friend to do the introductions this evening, Michael Karam who is a, a member of the Parents of Alumni Board. Michael has been a staunch reporter, or a supporter rather, of the school. We, we're, we're talking, the reporters will be talking after Michael. Um, but he's been a staunch supporter of the school really um, uh, since his daughter, Meredith, uh, was a student here. Uh, and some of you on this call are, uh, may remember that Michael's involvement in the fruit flies. I don't know if uh, any of you remember that, but we used to sell citrus. The fathers used to sell yeah. citrus to support the school. So Michael was uh, a very important uh, member of that initiative and has continued to support the school. And we're very uh, grateful to have him be part of our evening uh, today. So Michael, I'll hand it over to you um, and then we'll get on with the program. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, welcome, friends. My name is Brian said. My name is Michael Karam. And uh, my daughter Meredith was class of 2003. Uh, my late wife, Linda Morgan, was class of 1969. So she was the one who introduced me to Sigwell Friends. And uh, I was very glad that uh, Meredith went, to, they, we were able to send Meredith to school there so I could get a taste of the good Quaker education. Uh, I do serve on the Parents of Alumni uh, Steering Committee, and uh, it's a very, it's a wonderful way to keep back in touch with the school. Uh, tonight, uh, I have the honor of introducing two very special guests who also happen to be parents of alumni. Uh, the first is, uh, for many, will need no introduction, Bob Woodward. And uh, I've got right here, I don't have the books behind me, but here is the final days, and then 
the one that started it all, all the president's men. I still have my original copies, <laughs> read many, many years ago. And uh, so uh, Bob is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist, uh, began his career at the Post in 1973 and or 1971 and thereafter wrote uh, uh, all the President's Men, and then the final days, All the President's Men. Uh, for that, he received, the, and together with Carl Bernstein, received the uh, Pulitzer Prize. That was later uh, made into a, a, a movie starring Bob Woodward, and no, starring uh, Robert Redford <laughs> as, as Bob Woodward and uh, Dustin Hoffman as Carl Bernstein. Uh, these Watergate scandals about which he wrote led to numerous government investigations and the eventual res uh, resignation of President Richard Nixon. <clears throat> and Bob would go on to write a second, win a second Pulitzer Prize for his work covering 9-11. He's covered the last nine United States presidents and has written 20 books on American politics 13 of which have been num uh, number one bestsellers. He also uh, wrote two books about our most recently departed president. And I understand a third is in the works. <coughs> Elsa Walsh is a writer and author. Uh, and also it's the spouse of Bob Woodward. She's also, as Brian said, a member of the Board of Trustees. And uh, most recently she was a staff writer for the New Yorker, especially specializing in intimate profiles of world figures. She writes and speaks frequently about women's lives and is the author of the national bestseller, Divided Lives, The Public and Private Lives of Three American Women, which Entertainment Weekly called one of the 10 best books for that year. Uh, as Brian said, we're very lucky to have her as a member of our board of trustees. Um, I came across uh, a piece that she wrote in the Washington Post several years back. And the title uh, of this book, of this article was, Why Women Should Embrace a Good Enough Life. And I was very taken with the article, uh, particularly the point about, uh, yeah, particularly the point about you just not being perfect, not doing everything. Just have a, you know, a, have a good enough life. She said it was a, it was a sign of maturity and self-knowledge. She hit that one right on the head. And then uh, she also ended that story by saying that, um, uh, let's see. Ah, motherhood is not a job, it's a joy. So uh, it was a wonderful article. He came out in the wake of uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, and some of, some of that stuff. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Elsa, to uh, conduct the interrogation of your husband. Thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you, Michael, for that really warm introduction. And this is a, um, a, a great opportunity for Bob and me. We've had this ongoing conversation about journalism for uh, 40 years now, um, minute by minute, hour by hour. But this is a first for us because um, I've never interviewed Bob publicly before. He will say that I interrogate him daily, but this is actually the first time that we've done something like this. So I'm sort of wondering um, how much trouble I can get into without going over the line here. <laughs> I'm worried about my answers, not your questions. So I'm gonna jump right in um, and ask Bob, uh, you, you Mike, uh, Michael showed you know, all the president's men there, started with, with uh, uh, Nixon and then mentioned Trump. So you've gone sort of full circle there. And my question to you is, have we forgotten the lessons of Watergate? And what do, we, what do we know about Nixon that we can learn from that we see in Trump? And what is it that binds the two of them together? Yeah, boy, 10 questions. Uh, sounds like you. Uh, <laughs> first of all, uh, you know, have we forgotten the lessons of Watergate? I think yes. And uh, you, 
almost have to spend a moment addressing what was Watergate. Uh, a lot of people think it was just a burglary. Uh, actually, it was an effort uh, somewhat successfully to destroy the process of selecting who's going to run for president and then who's going to win. And of course, it exposed Nixon's dirty tricks of really a massive sabotage and espionage campaign directed at the Democrats. And it exposed much about him. And he, and he had this secret taping system that showed all these crimes. But what was potent about it was that it showed uh, who Nixon was. And uh, you know, and uh, remember when you covered the courts for the Washington Post, we would all, you would always come back too late uh, and uh, there would be cases and trials. And we discussed how in a courtroom, uh, the jury is supposed to weigh evidence and they do that some, but really what the jury is doing is studying character. Right, do I believe you? Yeah, uh, can I trust you? Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened to Nixon is the exposure of the crimes was substantial, but what really turned the Republican party against Nixon was his character. And they saw the lies, the deceit, the extent to which he, he conducted his presidency, uh, really in, everything was about let's get the enemies, let's, uh, let's hate. I mean, Nixon was a professional hater and he brought it to his presidency. So he had to resign, I think, because people said, yuck, this man's character doesn't fit. And uh, so let's jump ahead then to okay. the parallel with Trump. Uh, Nixon's tapes, which expose this, were all secretly made uh, without anyone's permission except really Nixon's. You had this extraordinary experience of interviewing Trump 17 times. And each time you would say to him, um, Mr. President, I'm going to turn on my recorder, is that okay with you? And he'd say yes. Yet those, what was seen in those tapes or heard in those tapes was not all that dissimilar in terms of sort of reflecting on his character. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, that's right. I mean, but th this also became a family adventure because right. you listened in right. with his knowledge and uh, as we know, he liked you much better than he liked me. And uh, he, uh, and, and uh, well, it will tell. I mean, the, well, one so, of the first times so the we, phone rings on a Saturday. Um, it was a Saturday. It was in the, we had just come in the door. It was uh, pre-COVID. And I picked up the phone and there was this male voice uh, that said, is Bob there? And I said, well, who's calling? And he said, Donald Trump. And I said, oh, just a moment, Mr. President, nice to speak to you. And it was, that was, that happened over and over and over again. It was, became this very surreal experience, particularly during quarantine where we were living in this very small bubble, but he would call you at what, all the, Oh, yeah, a... and we we had to uh, we uh, did the recordings on uh, tape recorders like this Olympus, uh, not to make an ad for them, but these are great little tape recorders, and we had them all over the house by the side of our bed, and in in the office, and uh, it was nine hours and forty two minutes of uh, these interviews and. I, I mean, there's a trajectory in the, here, which you can help me with. And uh, it was February 7th of last year uh, before the pandemic was a pandemic. 
Now, I was on a plane to Morocco. <laughs> yes, that's right. And I was traveling to California, and but I was here and had one of the conversations uh, with Trump. And he said the night before he'd been talking to President Xi of China, and then he went into this long, oh, this virus is really goes through the air. It's worse than the flu. And I was sure he was talking about China. Right. But you were also very focused because this book began as a book about national security. And you were really focused on what was going on with China and the U.S. national security. So he said this thing. Yeah. And I I thought, well, he it is uh, not a revelation because there were five cases of, of the virus in the United States at that time. And, uh, but then I would ask him about this periodically and he, and he would say, oh, well, I've always played it down because uh, I did not want to create a panic. And uh, I finally figured out, because uh, when you, I'm trying to ask the question, how did Trump on February 7th know that this virus was something that was going to dominate and kill lots of people. I mean, he, he said amazing things in these interviews, but I didn't know how he had learned of this. And so uh, it was not until May 1st in interviews that I learned there'd been a top secret meeting uh, in the Oval Office, the president's daily brief, the most sensitive meeting that the United States government conducts in which the secrets are laid out, uh, incoming intelligence and the national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, then said to President Trump, this uh, virus uh, that is coming uh, is going to be the biggest national security threat to your presidency by having followed 16 national security advisors, including Henry Kissinger, never heard of one saying so pointedly yeah, to the president. You actually had gone over to the White House to do this interview, which I wasn't that happy about because it was during the height of, of, of COVID. Yeah, in uh, May, and, in, in June, and, but I finally figured it out that there was this secret meeting. And, uh, and one of the interesting things you and I have always talked about is when you can spend the time that a book takes, you, you learn things in chronological order and people have criticized me, well, why didn't you tell us about no, you don't learn them in chronological order. You learn them sometimes out of chronological order. Well, yeah. no, you yeah. can only learn them in chronological <laughs> order. Uh, but you, uh, what what happens is people say, "Well, why didn't you know?" And I, I didn't know. Uh, Wuhan, China, had been locked down uh, at that time. Uh, Eleven million people. Anyway, so. We're, we're, this is uh, an adventure to learn about Trump. And of course, the bottom line is the uh, failure to, once I asked him, what's the job of the president? And he said, the, to protect the people. And he failed miserably to protect the people in this. And uh, he, he really should have taken what he knew and gone public and said, you know, I've been warned about this. And uh, so why do you why do you think he talked to you? Um, you you're, you had done one book earlier, Fear, in which you concluded that his presidency for the first two years represented a nervous breakdown of, of the president. System. It was a very stark, tough, tough book. And yet he talked to you. Yeah, um, what happened, he denounced the first book and people went to him and said, uh, uh, by the way, Mr. President, it's all true. And I knew, I mean, there were some other things. It's, it's complicated were, why people talk. But there were other presidents you've written 
tough things about and they don't always come back and talk to you. No, they, in <laughs> fact, they almost they never have. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted, he knew he was going to get his say. And um, see, no one, as best I can tell, no one in the White House and his staff knew he was doing this. And of course, when the book came out and showed the extent to which he knew what was going on and in public, as you may recall, he was saying, oh, it's going to go away. It's not serious. Don't worry about it. The exact opposite. And But what was interesting is that um, he would oftentimes call and he'd say, oh, you know, I've got all my joint chiefs waiting outside. I've got my generals waiting outside, so I can't spend very long on the phone. It would be a call he'd initiated. And then he would spend a very long time on the phone with you. It was, it was as if he wanted to speak to you more than he wanted to speak to them. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, he was he was making a sale. Look, people, we one of the things in our bus, business, as we all know, is that uh, people want to talk most of the time. And uh, you have to, in fact, it's Joe Biden in one of the books I wrote about Obama, uh, talk about Biden when he was vice president, his strategy was, and it's an interesting one, get people together, serve them breakfast, serve them lunch, take a long time and get them off their talking points because everyone has a talking point. And then you can perhaps find some area of, of agreement. And in a way, a reporter has to spend the time to get people off their talking points. And that means many hours of interviewing. I'm doing a book on the end of Trump, beginning of Biden with Bob Costa, colleague at the Post, who's, uh, he's 35, I'm 78. Uh, he, he is the best reporter I have uh, ever encountered as more energy. Uh, he makes me, as you know, I feel lazy. <laughs> Your lazy is a bit different from other people's definition of lazy, but <laughs> so. Um, okay, yeah. yeah, but but you know this, so anyway, it's the, it's so, the. So why do you, you've done, um, you've written about nine presidents you're now about to write about your your, your tenth um and some of the presidents talk and some don't and the most interesting sort of contrast is between george bush senior and george bush jr yeah that's talk right about what, when you went to talk about that yeah uh, uh, george herbert walker bush bush senior uh, would never talk to me. And he wrote you a very interesting letter. He wrote me a letter about why I wouldn't talk. And it, it was essentially, uh, well, you you remember that letter? I mean, it yes. was just this kind of pouring out, <laughs> uh, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to talk to you. You're, you're going to ask nasty questions. And uh, we didn't have a very good relationship. We had no relationship at all. Uh, he'd been chairman of the Republican National Committee during Watergate. He spent uh, over a year out defending Nixon and that was not a good memory. So I never talked to him. And then uh, his son became president. And I think one of the ways the son Bush Jr. George W. could kind of stick it to dad in a very minor way is to talk to me. Right, for four books. Yeah, for four books, uh, or for three of them, he talked to me. And I spent more time interviewing him than Trump, actually. And uh, he, uh, and, and, and again, it, it's the interesting psychology of it that, uh, I start and it started with 9-11 and it's going to do a book about tax cuts, tax cuts. And then 9-11 came along and even you helped me realize that. Uh, uh, no one's going to be interested in a tax cut. Yeah. Except uh, yeah. individuals. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that the better story was 9-11. Mm -hmm. And so I spent some time and sent Bush questions 
George W. And so, so I, why do you send the president questions? Well, because I mean, here's the yes, you're uh, some people would say, Ooh, you mm, shouldn't give them advance notice. No, no, but you see, you want them to be thinking about it and you want uh, them to realize that you're serious. And you have to understand the media environment a president lives in. And it is, you know, why'd you do that? You screwed up this. What's going to happen? What's the plan? And I send in a 15 page memo, I think, to Bush saying, I've done reporting and I understand this happened and you said this. Why? What was your reaction? What did you think of? Uh, Colin Powell, who was the Secretary of State. How about Rumsfeld? The, and once uh, you asked him, what? How do you think uh, history is going to judge you? Yes, yeah, and um, he. I think he booted that one. Uh, but what? What? So I send this memo and say I'd like to talk to him for the book. And uh, Condi Rice, who was his national security advisor called me and said, yes, uh, he's willing to talk to you. Uh, and uh, I said, great, uh, when? And uh, she said, uh, how about tomorrow morning? Mm. Because he wanted, see, you know, people- Because he saw the questions. He saw the questions, mm -hmm. he saw, reflected the work, but uh, we all kind of live in, with the illusion that we're misunderstood, right? Right. And so somebody which is, comes- Which is what Trump was feeling. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. right. And, you know, everyone's understood, uh, misunderstood, and also sometimes too understood. Uh, so it, it it's tricky. So Bush would uh, do this. He had his say. It was, um, you know, he, he, what? It, it really is, I mean, you know, you and I talked about this and I would show you the questions and you would scratch them out and say, you know, you got to add, this is too easy. You've got to get to the point. And uh, it, uh, it was a real opportunity. And I remember bringing back the transcripts from the first interview with him. And we talked about this, that Here's, and the first book was Bush at War. He's at right. war. Uh, Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, war against Al Qaeda. And uh, it, it, was, it was really interesting and powerful to see and the discussion you and I could have about, and at one point you said, you know, uh, when FDR, was present World War II, uh, there was no one who could come in and say, what happened here? Why, who did you believe? What was the this and that? And so the record of those Bush interviews, yes. which again, I have a package of, and uh, of Let's... course the important parts were used in the book is a real uh, unusual look at somebody at, war and then the second book was about the decision to so go you, to war in Afghanistan. So you've, written, uh, uh, you've Iraq, written, I'm sorry. You've written a lot about war, very focused on on um, war and presidents. And I wonder um, what you feel you've learned, what a president learns. Um, I recently the other day uh, learned that George Bush had 43 targeted killings, assassins of, of terrorists, and Obama had 343, and we tend to think, he, 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 ordered. he ordered them. And we tend to think of Obama as a more pacifist than George Bush. And what does that, what does that do to a president? You described this wonderful scene in um, your last book with uh, General Mattis going up to the National Cathedral um, he was Secretary of Defense, Defense at the time. And, you know, channeling Abraham Lincoln. And what did he say? Well, I mean, he was, Mattis was worried about maybe having to uh, order a nuclear strike in North Korea. And uh, because very dicey relationship and so forth. And uh, 
I'm glad you asked me that question because I don't remember the answer. What about Lincoln? Uh, I, I, I have been brought to my knees. Oh, yes, exactly. Lincoln said he in time, the Civil War, I've been brought to my knees. You have to go find some comfort and solace in prayer. So, so Mattis secret. goes into the National Cathedral and literally, uh, psychologically, but I, well, I think he did fall to his knees and pray. And uh, it was, a, for me, it was a real insight into the personal burden of war. And I, I mean, there's so many war stories. Uh, I have one of the- Do you oh, think Obama was affected by war? Didn't he once say to you when you asked him about going to war, he said, go read my Nobel speech? Yeah, I've got my Peace Prize. And, uh, and, and he essentially said, uh, you know, uh, war is a mistake. That was, and I, I think he's right about that. And I remember uh, General Odierno was the chief of staff of the army. Um, this was 12 years ago or so, um, used to invite me to come talk to the new generals, the one stars, and there would be about 100, 110 each year. And, they, you know, they, they call it charm school or whatever, To and the, the new generals would come to Washington. I'd go talk about the media, and Oni, Odierno would come in, and big bear of a man, had combat written all over him, uh, and was a very strong man. So he'd, co he'd come walk down the aisle and all these one stars are there. And of course he's got four and he said, generals, what's the job of the army? And all, yeah, all the hands go, <laughs> every one of them. And uh, calls on one. Chief, the job of the army is to recruit, equip, and prepare to fight and win wars. And everyone nods and says, yes, that good, good answer. What's the second job of the army? And all the general, second job of the army? Wait a minute, they didn't tell us we had another job. And they're baffled. And he says, generals, and you know, he's, he, the second job, of the army is to prevent war. And I will never forget that. And the, the you know, these were experienced army officers and, and they immediately got, yes, that's exactly right. But that is the job of the generals. And the more you get into covering war and getting to know the military, these are the people who, who don't want to fight because they know how unpredictable war is and the devastation it causes. And Do you have a, you have one, um, you oftentimes in your books have delicious little stories that never get any attention because they get overshadowed by um, the headlines, but I always have my personal favorites. And one of my personal favorites in this last book was with when Mattis went to meet with the um, head of the defense uh, in China and he brought him out to Mount Vernon. Right, uh, the, the head of the Chinese military right. came to Mount Vernon and uh, they're walking around there and, uh, and uh, Mattis says uh, essentially to him, you don't want to fight us. We know how to fight you Chinese. You haven't been in a serious war for a long time. Right. He said that most that he knew that this general had not been in battle. That's right. And of course, Mattis had been everywhere in battles. And it was a it was a real kind of moment of uh, it, it, it really, really was. Uh, a deterrence unto itself, because he said, and it, well, and he, he, brought had, out, he brought out all the Marines who were sort of, you know, 
perfectly in order who could also speak Mandarin and right. do this silent drill. And right. I, I think it was the army uh, rather than uh, the Marines. And, and uh, you know, it was a, a kind of punch in the face to uh, the head of the Chinese military, who uh, I, I believe, and I think there was some intelligence to show that, uh, you know, maybe we don't want to have a fight with the United States. So again, this is one of the deterrents of, of somebody like Mattis, who was experienced and also knew uh, the power of the American military, which is uh, even to this day unsurpassed. You think it's a mistake that so few presidents have served in the military? You know, you can't set an obligation, but it sure helps. Mm -hmm. uh, I've served in the Navy. In, uh, in, you were the first person I met who served in the military. <laughs> yeah, right, you thought, <laughs> oh my, but that was a tough date. <laughs> because you, it, was, it right. was really tough. Uh, you said, oh, you served in the military? In Vietnam? Vietnam, how many babies did you kill? <laughs> And uh, I said, uh, none. And uh, it was, and we actually, uh, in, in one of the books, uh, we had uh, General, or Admiral Crow, who the was commanders. chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the number one military man. We got to know and had him to dinner and uh, would sit around and uh, really looked at this leader who developed a secret back channel with the head of the Soviet military, Marshal Akramayev, and uh, to let you know, let's not let the politicians throw us into war. And Crow asked us to dinner one night with Marshal Akramayev, who had left and uh, left his post, and uh, you could see there was a real bonding. There. Well, they had traveled across country together, brought him to his home in, was it Kansas or Oklahoma? Uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. And, and crowd gone to the Soviet Union then. And uh, they became, you know, they said, uh, you know, these politicians, uh, it's, it's dangerous. Yes, they have the authority and in the United States constitutional authority to, to really uh, employ the military as they want and have sole power to use nuclear weapons. And so, you know, let's not let there be a mistake. And uh, I, I really, so, I really felt Crow uh, and put that in a page in one of my books and, you know, the, the right wing went nuts and said, this is, you know, Crow is us. conspiring with the commies yeah. to, a back channel yeah. and he was the chairman for Ronald Reagan and Reagan to his credit came out and, and said, uh, no, I, that's exactly what I want him to do, avoid war. So I think there have been so many things I've learned in our relationship and over the 40 years. And one of them was a real eye opener about the military. I came to our relationship believing that the military was very jingoistic and in fact, through you and through your work have discovered sort of quite the opposite that um, a lot of the military at the, at, at the top are, as yeah, you said. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I, I, I was urging you mm -hmm. to ask me the question, what's my weakness? Okay. And, and <laughs> as, as a reporter. I was being nice. Writer. And, and uh, it's a really important question. I'm not sure, I mean, we don't have time to, Oops, to yeah. list them all, but one of them is to figure out, uh, I can report, gather information, but one of the very clarifying weaknesses for me is, okay, done the reporting, what does it mean? And the last book, Rage, about Trump, which exposed this, you know, uh, failure to protect the people that if you had asked Dr. Fauci, he would say that 
hundreds of thousands of people died because of the failure of Trump to take this seriously. So I thought, you know, I'm going to say something at the end. And, and so uh, we're talking about this. And, uh, and then uh, we'll tell them what you did, because I lifted it verbatim, what you found out and how to frame the issue of what a president should be. Well, I think you overestimate your inability to sort of figure out what something means. I've always thought you have an incredible new sense. Um, but we yeah, were- But not a meaning sense. <laughs> <laughs> we, you had given me a draft of your epilogue, which was quite short and <laughs> ended with, Trump is the wrong man. Me concluding, my conclusion. And is that, that Trump is the wrong man. Was the man, wrong man for, for the, the job, job of president. Which was a pretty shocking thing for you to come out and say, because you've always tried to um, not put your finger, obviously, on the scale and make such a clear and direct judgment about somebody's fitness when they're in the middle of the campaign. Right, but I felt I knew too many Republican senators who knew who felt and the concluded same that he was the wrong man for the job and they would not say it publicly. Too cowardly. And I felt I could not join that parade. Right. I had to, uh, and it, it, in a way it's a mild formulation, the wrong man for the job. Uh, could have said lots so, of more. So you and I were talking, we were driving out, we were driving somewhere, and um, I said to you uh, in that February 7th interview, Trump had said, you know, one of the things about being a president is that you never know, there's always dynamite behind the door. And I said to you, you know, we always thought he was talking about something else, but the truth is that Trump was the dynamite behind the door and that he was the one that was sort of going to explode. But that if you went and you looked at sort of the kind of the lists of failings of his, one of the major ones was that he had the biggest microphone in the world and he had failed to use it properly. And in fact, had wasted that opportunity. And I said to you, you should go back and look at a president who really also dealt with a huge crisis, FDR. And, and you'd already done it. You've done the research. Right. And you found uh, after Pearl Harbor. Uh, fireside chats. Fireside chat by FDR, uh, really worth going and listening to it again, because here was a calamity. We'd been attacked by the Japanese, the uh, fleet, uh, you know, almost irreparably damaged, it, it seemed at the time. And so what did Roosevelt do? He went on and, and he said, uh, we, this is a major setback. Uh, our survival as a nation is in doubt. And I am counting on all of you. I am telling you this truth that I'm not saying, no, I don't want to create a panic. I, you know, it was met it head on and said, uh, we, I know you and I know you will be strong and uh, we will mobilize and uh, we will win this war, but it's going to be very painful for this country and very expensive. And if you listen to this, and then you and you said, this is exactly what Trump didn't do. And so, as I say, confess, lifted what FDR said uh, and made the point that this is well, you attribute it to F FDR. You didn't yeah, lift it. no, but I. But the idea, I mean, it's not something I thought of. It was something that you thought of. So 
I see that we're kind of running up to the deadline um, of, the, of, of this evening. And there are lots of really great questions that were submitted. And one was um, the nine presidents you covered who had the most positive impact on the country. And I'd like to sort of add a little to that, which was, who do you think was the most moral president? Yeah, well, it's, it's, <coughs> it's tough. I think I know the answer, but it's going to be a surprise. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's Gerald Ford. Mm -hmm. And Gerald Ford, who pardoned Nixon, which I thought at the time, I remember uh, it, uh, Ford went about, he'd been president 30 days, went on television on a Sunday morning and announced he was giving Nixon a full pardon. And Carl Bernstein woke me up and said, have you heard? And I had been asleep. And uh, he said some, something I'll never forget. He said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son <laughs> of a bitch. And, uh, and I've immediately understood <clears throat> what had happened. And the thought I've, I had, and I think people in the country did, and, and Ford lost to Jimmy Carter a couple of years later, I think because of the pardon and the suspicions that there was a deal and that uh, Ford had done this for Nixon who had appointed Ford to the vice presidency when Spiro Agnew resigned. And uh, many years later, 20 years later, I embarked on one of my books, Shadow, about the legacy of Watergate and the presidencies of Ford through Clinton. And I, called Gerald Ford up and said, I'd like to talk about the pardon figure. And, you know, he said, gee, I'm sorry, I've got a golf tournament or something. And he said, sure. Oh, most, most open person. Now, this is 20 years after the presidency, did a series of seven interviews with him, all taped. I mean, again. We yeah. flew out to Palm Springs <clears throat> to, yeah, to meet uh, with him. Yeah. And, uh, went to his house at Rancho Mirage. And it, I kept, you know, what happened here? What really, because there was, uh, there were charges, there was a deal and so forth. And so we're at his little, uh, he had a small ranch house with his wife, Betty in Rancho Mirage. He had a little uh, golf hole right mm -hmm. outside the putting green. And we're sitting in his office and, uh, you know, you so this is the, you know, you want to get beyond the talking point. What really happened? And he said, okay, I'm going to tell you what really happened. He said, uh, uh, before Nixon resigned, about a week, uh, Al Haig, who was Nixon's chief of staff, came to me and said the president's going to resign. It was not known. Uh, if you give him a pardon. And I'm going, holy moly, there was a deal. And I said that to Ford. So there was a deal. And he slammed his fist. I said, there was no deal. Let me tell you what happened. I rejected that deal because I know knew it would be corrupt. But then I became president when Nixon resigned. And I realized Everything was about Nixon. Everyone was saying, is, is Nixon going to go to jail? Is he going to be investigated? What about this? And he said in this plaintive voice, I could not have my own presidency. And I realized that <clears throat> not for me <clears throat> or Nixon or Nixon's family or his supporters, for the country, the national interest was to move on from Nixon. And I had to grant this, I had to give him a pardon to get Nixon off the front page and into the history books. And they made an agreement, Nixon had taken his secret tapes to California, that the tapes would have to come back. And of course that they're released period periodically. I think, I mean, they, they still, I don't think they're we call all it the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> it's more than that. I mean, it's it's the definition of Nixon's 
uh, smallness and this this hating. But so uh, I concluded that in the book that what Nixon and what Ford did uh, rather than a corrupt deal was actually quite heroic. An act of courage. An, a, 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 an amazing act of farsighted courage. And I put this in the book and Caroline Kennedy, the daughter of the late president, John F. Kennedy called me up and said that she and her uncle, Teddy Kennedy had read this and were giving Gerald Ford the Profiles and Courage Award for somebody who does what her late father, late president wrote in his book, Profiles and Courage. And uh, we're gonna give it to Ford, not for being president or for being a politician, but for the single act of pardoning Richard Nixon. And what a cold shower for me. I didn't go to the ceremony. They have ceremony. I watched it and, and Ford gets up there kind of partially vindicated, partially understood, partially misunderstood. And in this swirling and uh, I, you, you had to, and you and I talked about this, that you had to look at this as a very large lesson for journalism, for human relations, for history, that what at one moment looks like the ultimate crime. And then you look through 20 years later, go to people, really excavate the record, and you realize that what looked like a deal and a crime was an act of courage. So do you find yourself remembering that as you are reporting now? Everything, every time, you know, you have to make judgments, but then what it does is drive you to going back and back and inter interviewing people uh, repeatedly, because once you do a first draft, a second draft, you realize there are unanswered questions. And so, as you mentioned at the beginning, you're 78. Uh, why huh. why do you keep doing it? And what, um, as one of the, the um, participants asked, what advice would you have to young people? Well, the, the advice to young people, um, which is in kind of what, um, what the Sidwell Friends education is about, quite frankly, and I think many ed educations, uh, but we know it firsthand is uh, find work that you know that you love. Don't compromise yourself. That the most important thing in your life are the human relations you have. But the second is what you really do, and don't get trapped by somebody else's idea of what I. My father thought I should be a lawyer, and I was, and I got out of the navy, and I thought, my God, I'll be thirty when I get out of law school. It's the end of life, which is what you think when you're 30, or at least I did. And uh, so I got a job at the Washington Post, failed the tryout, realized I love the work and called my father and said, I'm not going to law school. I've got a job for $110 a week at the Montgomery County Sentinel and uh, Maryland suburbs here. And my father, who was a very calm and non, though he was a judge at this point, non judgmental person, said to me, You are effing crazy. He still thought you were. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, even, even that, I mean, until, it's a, it's a wonderful the, thing. Up until the time he died, he couldn't <laughs> quite figure out why you had done this rather than that. Oh, okay. Well, maybe, <laughs> uh, maybe that's true. But, you know, as soon as he said that, I knew I was on the right track <laughs> because you don't want the uh, parental endorsement, frankly. You, there has to be a little bit of 
defiance in all of this. And the Bob once gave an interview um, and he said, um, all good work is done in defiance of management. So the next day at the Washington Post, there were a lot of people with little buttons. <laughs> <laughs> it was not very popular management at that time. Yeah. What did the button say? Jail Bob <laughs> or something like that. And, you know what? Uh, just one last thought um, mm -hmm. working at the Post, as you know, for the years you worked there, I mean, it's, it's stressful, it's tough, and it's fun. Uh, and, and it's fun. And it's, it's always you. The, the Grahams and now Bezos who owns it are, are experts at always raising the bar. You never have done enough, you never. And so after Nixon resigned, Catherine Graham, who was the owner publisher of the Post, sent Carl Bernstein and myself a letter and not on all that wonderful stationery she had, but it was on a yellow uh, legal pad she had written and uh, it said, uh, dear Carl and Bob, now that Nixon's resigned and you did some of the stories, don't start thinking too highly of yourselves. And let me give you some advice. And she said, the advice is beware the demon pomposity. And uh, if you think not just about that time, but about now, Pomposity is a, an affliction that many people have in politics, government, education. I know you're, Brian, you'll be shocked to hear that. And uh, that uh, on Wall Street and uh, in the news media, the, you look, look at the cable channels and thing, there is a kind of uh, self certainty, a kind of smugness, whether on left or right, you know, this is the way it is, this is truth, this is, uh, there's no alternative explanation for what's going on. And we have a, in our house, Bob always gets a little annoyed because I'll say, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> Who told me that? And, and uh, Catherine Graham uh, told me that <laughs> and I, I it, it's really good advice uh, you know I, I think uh, everyone gets and certainly me you get ah I got this right I really nailed this you know what you never really nail it and you have to keep going you know, it, the search is forever and you know you know uh, about Nixon tapes come out. Uh, we, we went uh, to Kent State a couple of years ago. Right. And I had to give a speech about uh, the Kent State shootings where, shootings where uh, four Kent State students were killed. And I had asked somebody to do some research on Nixon's statements about Kent State and found I mean, here. An audio tape that had not been released. And that, that showed his uh, really malice toward people who were protesting the war, his war. That the shooting that was kind of a, would, would make him stand down, right? Yeah, Something that like somehow, that. you know, that'll, the, the, you know, that'll put him, that'll show him. I mean, just, but but again, that's Nixon. So there are always surprises. So I think we reached the, the end. And I, there was just one last sort of Sidwell related question was that, dear, does Mr. Woodward remember the mini mester he led at the Washington Post for a group of us in 1993? I remember lots of things from 1993. It's things that happened last <laughs> week. <laughs> yes, we did. We, we uh, daughter uh, Tally and some of her classmates, we went out uh, to a place we have in Maryland and we did all kinds of things. And, you know, it was, did a nature walk and talked about the environment. And uh, it was, a, it was, I do remember it. I'm glad some. 
Somebody else remembered it. Yeah. So both Bob and I um, have oftentimes said about our relationship with Sidwell and our experience at, at Sidwell has been really one of the most important ones of our lives. Um, we feel sort of deeply indebted and grateful to the experience that we've had there with, with uh, all of you, Brian, Min, Mamadou, um, that it has been both a source of comfort and home and intellectual stimulation and just um, fun too. Thank you friends uh, for uh, a remarkable evening that I don't think we will soon forget. Uh, two wonderful reporters, two wonderful thinkers, two wonderful writers, uh, two wonderful people. Thank you for uh, sharing this evening with us this evening. And if we could all close with a moment of gratitude for uh, this extraordinary community and for the generosity uh, that Bob and Elsa demonstrated uh, for us this evening. Thank you, friends. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks, Brian. Thanks to our advancement team too for putting this together. Thank you. Emma. Anna, Michael, thanks for the introduction. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Great job. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.